What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot podcast. This week, we're finishing the book of Isaiah. We're in one of the most famous sections here at the end. A lot of forward-looking prophecy, some of which has not been fulfilled yet. We'll be starting the book of Jeremiah, although we'll save most of our comment for Jeremiah for next week. But we're also reading the book of First Thessalonians and the whole book of Second Thessalonians. And we're starting the book of First Timothy, but we're going to save that till next week because we'll talk about all the pastoral epistles next week. So we're focusing on Isaiah and the two letters to the Thessalonians. So back in Isaiah, you remember that we've been looking at forward-looking prophecy really since Isaiah chapter 40. And now God is going to talk about the people who are going to receive this hope even now. He says, there are people who are foreigners. There are people he calls eunuchs. He says, even they can be added to this thing that God is doing. It's not like they're completely cut off. They can be forgiven in chapter 56. And he says in chapter 57, the people that I will be close to are not the high and mighty, not the proud, not the arrogant, but one of the best verses in all the Bible is Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, where it says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So what that means is God not only is exalted and holy, as we already saw that he was in Isaiah chapter 6, but he also is compassionate, but not towards just any kind of sinners, not just towards any kind of lowly people, but the type of people who are lowly in the sense that they're contrite, They want to repent. We already saw that in chapter 55 last week. But those are the people that he's close to. Those are the people that he's going to save. That's really been the message of the whole book of Isaiah. Even if you go back to chapter 1, where he offers them salvation, but but they've got to turn from their sin. He says that again. Then, chapter 58, speaking of things that remind us of the beginning of the book, he talks about their fasting. And he says, okay, you know the fast that I really want? You know, you know what I really want you to stop doing? You know, when fasting, you, you stop eating. He says, you know what I really want you to stop doing? I want you to loose the bonds of wickedness. I want you to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. He says, is it not the fast that I want to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? What was happening in Israel at this point is you've got these rules, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, about how there shouldn't be poor in the land because you should be caring for your brothers, the people who are Israelites. They're not only your brothers because they live near you, but they're also your brothers biologically, right? These These are your cousins. This is your family. You should be taking care of them. And if there's people who are rich oppressing the poor, that's always an issue. We see it come up in the minor prophets as well, where certain minor prophets call out the sins of Israel because at that time, as what tends to happen is, People with a lot were taking advantage of people who didn't have much. And that was something that was clearly against God's rules for the people of Israel. And he says, you guys haven't been following the law. You haven't been, and obviously it's not just about the law, it's about the people too. You haven't been caring for each other. There hasn't been the love and the loving your neighbor as yourself that there should have been in the land of Israel. He says, that's what I want you to stop doing is stop um, oppressing the poor in your land. He says, that's a problem. And, And notice, what's God getting back to? He's getting back to righteousness. He's getting back to, I want my people to live in righteousness. I want there to be justice, not just through God coming and punishing sin, but he says, I also want you to live in a way that's right. That leads to chapter 59, where very famous verse at the beginning of this chapter, after you might wonder, okay, these people are doing evil and okay, well, they're reaching out to God. They're, they're kind of keeping the Sabbath sometimes. They're, they're kind of doing some good things for God. He says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wickedness. He says, the problem is these people are sinful, and they have not done what's right. And he says, that's why your prayers are are bouncing off the ceiling, so to speak. That's why God's not listening to your prayers because it doesn't come with repentance from sin. It's just, oh yeah, God, I want this, I want that. Oh, we want a right relationship with you, when really they don't. And God is very clear, that's what's causing a problem, which again, 
we look at Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, and we find something that's true, not just about those Israelites, but that's true about all sinners when it comes to our sin. It creates a separation between us and God. Whether you're talking about Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden, or even if you're talking about a Christian who sins against God, who's in right relationship with God, there is still a level of separation that takes place because we don't like to sin and be in God's presence. We, we do uh, one of two things, typically. We choose to do what's sinful, or we choose to go towards God. And we typically don't choose both of those at the same time. And sin is a massive problem, so much of a problem, that he says in this chapter, God says, I looked, and there was no one to fix the problem. Nobody stepped up. Nobody was, was doing the right thing. He says, justice is turned back. Truth is lacking. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Which, by the way, when you hear breastplate of righteousness and helmet of salvation, you might be thinking of Ephesians 6. That's the armor of God. Well, where did Paul get that imagery from? He got it from right here. And, and who's wearing the armor of God, by the way? Um, you know, the genitive of God in Greek, right? Well, it, it's God's armor. He's wearing it here, right? Like, who's wearing the armor? It's God's armor. And in, in Ephesians 6, Paul says, you're supposed to take up the armor of God. It's like God already wore this armor, so to speak. That's the, that's the idea. And the whole point is God saying, I'm going to have to intervene. I'm going to have to save. And really, he's going to save through his servant, the servant of the Lord. That's Jesus Christ, God himself. Um, then, after 59 ends, we get another turning point. After this, he, he says, my covenant will be on them. I'll put my spirit on them. They'll have my words in their mouth. And then he says, arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. And the nation shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. He's saying something's going to happen to where the whole world is going to pay attention to Israel, to Jerusalem, to this place, because the light is going to shine there. There's a lot of New Testament imagery that picks up on that idea that Jesus is the light. And even some of this is forward looking. The wealth of the nations coming to you. Uh, multitudes of camels from Midian and Ephah and Sheba and Kedar and Naboth. Like, where, what is all this wealth of the nations coming to Jerusalem? Well, this is a challenge that people have in interpretation to understand what exactly this means. You could say this is purely symbolical and figurative, and it just refers to people paying attention to the gospel in Jesus, which, you know, that, that, there's truth to that. I guess that's, that's possible. Or you could say, uh, that there's something about this that's literal that's going to happen in the future that has not taken place. Because what you can't say is this was perfectly fulfilled, as God said, in the past. And with God's promises, really, it comes down to a couple things. you got to choose in your interpretation. Either God is going to change how he uh, will fulfill this prophecy, do, do something different than what he said, so he's going to change his mind. Or this was all highly figurative, and it was not meant to be taken literally. Or God has not done it yet. And really in those three categories, we find ourselves really, I think in this podcast, falling in the third category, thinking that the way that God keeps promises is so specific that if it talks about wealth of the nations coming to this area, then I think the wealth of the nations is going to come to this area. Perhaps it just has not taken place yet. And that's why even in this section here, in Isaiah 60 to 66, the book of Revelation picks up on this imagery. Like for example... In chapter 60, verse 11, it says, Your gates shall be open continually, day and night, they shall not be shut, that people might bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings leading in procession. And you're like, okay, why is that important? Well, that's the same language that's used in Revelation 21, verse 25, about the gates of the new Jerusalem always being opened and never being shut. Okay, so if Revelation's written later, right, and Isaiah's written earlier, it seems like God is trying to tell us in the book of Revelation, hey, I'm referring back to what I just talked about in the book of Isaiah, and, and that's pretty clear. We're talking about pretty much the same thing. And furthermore, Revelation 21, verses 23 and 24, talk about how there's going to be no sun by day because you know, the glory of God is going to give light to that place. Well, guess where that comes from? Isaiah 60, verse 19. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. 
So when you read that, I hope just reading this section of Isaiah is helpful for you because a lot of famous passages and famous concepts that we think come from the book of Revelation don't originate in the book of Revelation. They're repeated in famous sections, but they they really, they come from like Ezekiel and Isaiah and some come from the, even the book of Genesis. A lot of the book of Revelation comes from Genesis. So anyway, here in chapter 61 also, the beginning of this chapter starts with a, a phrase that is quoted by Jesus. In fact, Jesus opens the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue of Nazareth, and he speaks, and he reads this passage. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where the text stops in in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. But it goes on here to say, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. And it goes on. But Jesus stops in the middle of verse two in the book of Luke. And he says, hey, this text, this prophecy has been fulfilled in me. I am the fulfillment of this. And he doesn't complete the end of the section because I think what he's saying is in the gospel of Luke and the gospel of Matthew, I'm doing the first half of this, but I'm not doing the second half of this right now. The second half of this is going to happen. And I think Jesus is going to do it. It just wasn't on his first time coming to earth as a man. Chapter 62 looks forward to the new name that the land is going to get. This place is going to be called no longer desolate, but it's going to be called my delight is in her and your land will be called married right? As a young man marries a young woman, so your sons, sons shall marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God shall rejoice over you. Talking to Zion, talking to Jerusalem, which again, you have a choice in interpretation. Either this is not exactly what he meant, or it hasn't been fulfilled yet completely. And I think that's, that's the camp we want to find ourselves in in interpretation here. Uh, then chapter 63 talks about just a quick summary of of the problem here. The people rebelled against God. Chapter 64, we get a famous verse about how the righteous deeds that they've done are like filthy rags. They're, they're not even acceptable in God's presence. And that's true even for our good deeds that we do before coming to Christ. If we're trying to earn God's favor in some way, our righteousness is all mixed in with bad motives. It's mixed in with selfishness. It's mixed in with all these problems that you know, even the best things we do, like how good are really the best things that we do? They're, they're filthy rags in God's sight. Uh, and then chapter 65 and 66, wrapping it all up, uh, God talks about how he was ready to be sought by those who were rebellious, but they would not seek him. He says, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that's not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth tainted, uh, broth of tainted meat is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourselves, don't come near me, for I'm too holy. For these are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their bosom both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. And just another reminder of the problem that was going on in Israel at this point. They're doing wrong. And he says, because of that wrong, I have to judge. But then in the middle of the chapter, he says, behold, I'm going to create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Right? That should remind you of Revelation 21, verse 4. Same idea. He's talking about how Jerusalem will be like a joy to the people. Then there's some interesting language about how there won't be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who doesn't fill out his days. For the young man shall die at a hundred years old and a sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Like if someone dies at a hundred, it's like, ooh, they died young. They must have been in sin. Like they were doing the wrong thing. They, they, they got in trouble with God. They must have been disciplined. It, it says you shall build, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit, which is just classic language in the Old Testament about blessing, right? Uh, they won't labor in vain or build or bear children for calamity. The whole point is there's going to be peace. There's going to be prosperity. 
the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. Uh, which even that, the dust shall be serpent's food. Where, where did that come from? Oh yeah, wait, that came from Genesis chapter 3 when God told the serpent in the curse, you're going to eat dust. The whole point is evil, sin, Satan, he's going to, you know, going to be messed up. He's going to be out because they shall not destroy, they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain, says the Lord. So again, more interpretive challenges here. Like what is this talking about? Is this talking about people actually physically dying in the place of God's perfection? And if that's the case, really that, that's why a lot of people look at these passages and say, seems like most of this prophecy is going to be fulfilled in what we call the millennial kingdom, where on earth, on this earth, Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. That These prophecies about the nations flowing there, these prophecies about people looking to Mount Zion, Mount Zion being the highest of all the hills, seems like these prophecies will be fulfilled at this point in time. Uh, then in chapter 66, another great theological statement that God says, he says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came, came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's the kind of people that God loves to bless and God loves to be near. So later on in this passage, we see more rejoicing with Jerusalem, more good times, more uh, peace. In, in chapter 66, verse 12, it says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. Right, That classic uh, phrase from It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, comes from right here, peace like a river. That's in the future here in particular. And then it ends with more judgment. It ends with, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like a whirlwind to rend his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. And when you hear that, you might hear, some of the phrases of the New Testament ringing in your head. I certainly do. I think of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, which is what we're going to read this week. We're going to transition over the book of First and 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul picks up on that same idea, and he says, you realize that judgment is going to come for the people who are enemies of God's people, and the enemies of the gospel, and they're going to suffer, and it's going to be with flames of fire. And that's how Jesus is going to enter into judgment with these people who refuse to love God's people and refuse to obey God's word and God's gospel. He says judgment is coming for them. So as Isaiah looks forward, it, it, it does the same thing that all books that look forward do. It says, hey, you know how great it's going to be when God reigns? You know how amazing it's going to be when righteousness takes over? Oh, it's, it's going to be great. But you know what has to happen first is judgment. Is God taking out his enemies. And you know what you should do now? You should trust God now. You should live righteously now. You should be the kind of people like you want to be in this righteous world in the future. You should just be that way now. That's always the response that we should have to God's word about this. And that's really what God's word is driving his people towards, whether you're talking about the book of Isaiah or the book of 2 Thessalonians. So before we get to 2 Thessalonians, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. We start here in chapter 3. Paul is talking about how much he loves these people. And don't forget that. He's talking to people who are not with him face to face anymore. But he clearly loves them, and they clearly love him back. And he sends Timothy. And when Timothy's there, he's there to establish and exhort them in their faith to say, you're going to suffer affliction, but you got to do it righteously. And when Timothy comes back to Paul, he says, in our distress, and our affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith because we know you have been established in your faith. He says, for now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. And that's a crazy statement. He says, we're doing well as long as we hear that you're doing well. It doesn't even matter what's going on in my life and in my ministry. I just want to know that you're standing fast in the Lord. And if you Thessalonians are doing it, that brings so much comfort to me. He says, for what thanksgiving can we return to our God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, right? That is a mature understanding of love for people, right? It's like, I'm so wrapped up in how they're doing 
that my joy before God is constant and solid because they are following the Lord. He says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, right? It's like, he's just reminding them how much he loves them. And in chapter four, he says, okay, I love you guys. I need you to stand firm in the faith. And remember, you don't really need to be taught about love. Like you're doing really well in love. We talked about that, but here's what you do need to know. He says, you need to walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord and do so more and more, right? This is where I think sometimes Christians go wrong in talking about how, you know, Christians shouldn't focus on pleasing God. It's like, okay, if what you mean by that is no one can please God on his own outside of Christ to earn God's merit and favor, you're hundred percent right. We, we can't, but don't miss passages like this where Paul's clearly telling these Christians, you should care about pleasing the Lord, do what's pleasing the Lord. And please him more and more. He says, for you know what the instructions that we gave you through our Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. He says, this is what God wants you to do. Be sanctified, be righteous. And he says, the first thing that they're supposed to not do is abstain from sexual immorality. A very powerful passage about that, where it even says that God is an avenger in all of these things. So don't wrong your brother or your sister in these areas, because when you do that, it's not just sinning against each other. You're sinning against God and and God will repay. It's like God takes this, this stuff personally when his people are personally taken advantage of. So he says that's wrong. Also in this passage, we, we get a section about the coming day of the Lord where he says, I don't want you to be unformed. I want you to know what's going to happen. So you don't freak out so that when people die, you're not thinking, Oh, well they missed it. Cause again, think about it in this generation, they haven't had hundreds of years of church history. They were expecting Jesus to come back, rightfully so, because that's what Jesus kept saying he was going to do. He told his disciples when he left, is I'm going to come back the same way I, I, I left. And the expectation throughout the whole New Testament is the imminent return of Jesus. And this passage talks about that. And at the end of this passage, very important, I think people miss this, verse 18 it says, therefore, encourage one another with these words to remind people that Jesus is returning should be an encouragement to God's people. Uh, then chapter five, continuing to talk about the day of the Lord says it will come like a thief, right? That's uh, unexpected intruder, right? Thieves don't tell you when they're, they're coming. Usually he says, so now we're supposed to live as children of the light. Let's, let's live like it. Let's walk like it. We're not destined for wrath. Right? The non-Christians are the people who are opponents of these people. Yeah. They might be destined for wrath, but we're not. So he says, Get along with your church, basically, is the end of chapter five. It's a great section, a lot of imperatives, a lot of do this, don't do this, think like this, don't think like that. There's many great things here from the end of First Thessalonians 5. That leads us to the book of Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians is about encouragement and affliction, a lot like First Thessalonians, but there's more teaching about the day of the Lord, and there's more warning for them not to get idle, right? which is interesting because a lot of people historically who have been highly focused on the day of the Lord can oftentimes drift into a type of idleness where they say, well, I don't need to do anything. Like I'm just waiting for Jesus to return. Even in some cult groups, you had instances, even in our country, in America, of people selling all their stuff, getting rid of everything because they're like, well, Jesus is going to come back right now. So I don't need to work. It's funny that in this book about the day of the Lord, you also get a very clear encouragement to keep working, which is not new to Paul. I mean, Jesus says the same thing. That's the whole point of the imminent return of Christ. He says, keep working because you don't know when I'm coming back. So keep working like a servant who doesn't know the, the, the day or the hour that his master will come back. So keep working. So chapter one, we talked briefly about earlier in the book of Isaiah, but Paul's praying for them and their afflictions. He wants them to remember that God is going to judge those who oppose them, which can be an encouragement. God's going to take care of our enemies that, that, Reminds us that God is on our side here. Then chapter two, he reminds them that Jesus has not returned yet. That's important. It seems like maybe some people were saying that that happened, but he says no. And he reminds them that the man of lawlessness that's referenced in Daniel and in the book of Matthew chapter 24 as well, he says, remember, he hasn't been, he hasn't appeared yet, but lawlessness is happening. It's not like, you know, lawlessness is not everywhere, but the man of lawlessness has not been revealed yet. Similar to what John says in first John. You know, the Antichrist is coming, but there's plenty of Antichrists because the spirit of Antichrist is here. People are not doing the right thing and they're opposing Christ all the time. So there's lawlessness. 
It talks about this one being restrained. And then once he's not restrained, then all of a sudden things will go wrong. And he says, the people who refuse to believe the gospel in chapter one, right? they're the enemies of the gospel. They're not believing it. He says, but what's going to happen is there's going to come a strong delusion and people will think the man of lawlessness is good. He says, so you guys should just stand firm. That's that's the that's the application for Christians. He says, you, through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief in the truth, right, you guys need to stand firm. He ends that chapter with a great statement. He says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your heart and establish them in every good work and word. That's a great summary of what it is like to be a Christian. We want to be established in the truth. We want to be comforted in our hearts. We, we Everybody wants that, but how do we do that? Well, doing every good work and trusting every good word. So that leads to the last chapter here. Second Thessalonians 3, he says, please pray for us. Right? We, we want the gospel to go out clearly. Uh, God's faithful. We know that we he's going to protect us. He's going to help us. But he says, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Right? We want to be like that. We want you to be like that. So he says, all right, there's this problem in your church. Idleness. Don't imitate idleness. We were working hard. You guys should work hard. Don't grow weary in doing good. He says, even here in chapter 3, verse number 10, he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. So he's reminding them something that he already said. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That's a great principle. He says, we already taught you, and we're going to remind you, and I'm so glad that Paul included that here in this book, and he didn't just say, oh, that you guys already know this, right? God's Spirit wanted us to know this. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. It's a good principle for us to remember that God expects us to labor and expects us to work and to do what we can to serve God and his people. And he says, people aren't even willing to do that, then, then they shouldn't even eat, which goes against some of the ideas that Christians have, that Christians should always just give things and resources and money and assistance to anyone and everyone, right? It's like, well, we should give help and assistance. Absolutely. We should do that, but not to anyone and everyone because the, the New Testament is very clear here. And even the examples in the book of Proverbs is clear. It's not just the New Testament, it's the Old Testament too, that no, we, we don't give money to anyone and everyone because if someone's not willing to work, let him not eat. And sadly, sometimes out of a misplaced compassion, even Christians can affirm people in their own sin by maybe giving resources to people who should be working as opposed to receiving things like that. So important that we get this instruction here in God's word. And we should just be thankful how God is so wise to give us all of what we need. He gives us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And I hope that as you read this week, particularly in the book of Isaiah and these two books of First and Second Thessalonians, that you are encouraged by what God has to say, that you know better of who God is, and you are looking forward even to his prophecies being fulfilled in the future. Just like what Paul says to the Thessalonians, these things should comfort us in whatever afflictions Christians face today. So we'll see you back next week for another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot podcast. 